Welcome to another episode of Carpool. Uh, this week's passenger is a remarkable man, uh, born in Jamaica, moved to this country when he was four years old, came from a very poor background, and has had a remarkable life, a truly remarkable life. Really intriguing guy. Um, I, the reason I came across him was through eating his sausages. Isn't that marvellous? Black farmer sausages. Gorgeous, and they're gluten-free. They really are nice sausages. I'm, don't, I'm under no obligation to say that. <laughs> it's simply the truth. They are fantastic sausages. So please welcome into the passenger seat the black farmer, Wilfred Emmanuel Jones. Beautiful. I didn't, I don't, I mean, I sort of think I know Chippenham, but I don't know no, this no, bit. No, it's really nice. Beautiful. It's all right. Yeah. I'm just at the top floor. Right, there. how fantastic. So Beautiful. it's very, very, it's very, very central. And uh, yeah. this is on St. Mary Street. Right. And uh, St. Mary Street is, is one of the oldest roads in, in Chippenham. Right. And there's some wonderful um, houses yeah. um, uh, along here. Uh, these are a bit too expensive for me, but it's nice being on the edge of yeah. <laughs> It's slightly unfortunate that your cameras um, don't actually they go show you the outside, outside world. Well, I don't want people to get too, you know, get too much information. <laughs> <laughs> I want a lot of people to come and visit though. Yes, we, we yeah. need a lot of tourists there. Yeah. But then, I mean, I first became aware of you with through my wife, who's celiac. Oh yeah. And you know, we we, you know, we found all sorts of you know, it's been a challenging thing to deal with. Well, um, with, with, she has, with she has celiac disease. Celiac, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, so yeah. she can't eat any flour, you know, just to explain to viewers who don't know what that is, yeah. she can't eat any gluten, it's gluten allergies. That's right, yeah. And, and yeah. I'll tell you what's really interesting, I think the, the statistics are, there is something like one in a hundred people have some sort of wheat intolerance. Right. And uh, one of the reasons why I launched my brand is that I wanted to get a mainstream product that not only could people with um, a wheat intolerance eat, but also the mainstream yeah. could eat. Because if there's a person in the family that has um, this sort of wheat intolerance, it affects the whole family. Yeah. And the worst possible thing is that, you know, the person with this um, condition is forced to um, eat something, and they tend to be pretty disgusting, horrible um, foods that they yeah. eat for seeing the accent, you know, and I wanted to do something that was pretty... Well, I mean, that's good. the thing is, because we sometimes we've had, you know, like my wife's bread, yeah. Uh, strangely enough, the children and I don't want to eat that. No, yeah. <laughs> well, you see, for me, that is the that is an ultimate test. The right. ultimate test is that it's it's got to be a product that is seen by those who don't have the condition yeah. as something that right. they but would quite happily. The eat. sausages are incredibly popular. Thank I mean, they're every, we all eat them, and they are really, you know, regardless of anything else, they're really nice sausages. Exactly. And then the fact that they're gluten free as well is a kind of, exactly. you know, in a sense, from our point of view, is an added bonus. And you know, we can actually have sausage and mash. Yeah, it's and we can all eat the same thing, and I mean, I can't tell you how yeah. rare that is. It's I, fantastic. Well, it's brilliant. It's a bit like being black, really. So, so sort of, um, <laughs> because you're a celiac, it doesn't mean that you should be ghetto no. or, 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 or uh, sort of stereotyped. That's it a means, new analogy I haven't it, thought of before, but I like it. Yeah. <laughs> celiacs don't have to be um, ghetto No, right? they, they don't could, all have to live in the same area. Exactly. <laughs> they, they, could be, they could be part of the mainstream. <laughs> <laughs> but that, I mean, it is quite, it, you know, it is, I, well, I saw, a, I found a thing on YouTube last night, which presumably was a TV report done about you a while ago. Yeah. You know, where they did find another black farmer who was yeah. further, a chicken farmer, wasn't it? But I mean, it is. No, 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 he does maize. Like, does, does yeah, he? Because I, I went to see him, actually. Oh, right. So he's, um, he's got a, um, a small farm just outside London. Right. And he's from Zimbabwe, a really, really nice guy. Yeah, he seemed like a lovely guy. Yeah. Very, very nice guy. And he, and he does white corn. Right. Um, so that's what he does. And I yeah. thought it'd be quite nice if we could um, do something together and call the two black farmers. Yes. Can you imagine that? <laughs> that <would be> very <laughs> but I mean, the, the, the simple fact, I mean, I was born and grew up in the countryside. Yeah. And then, you know, I lived in London for many years and I got loads of black mates in London who yeah. I met once I was almost really once I was an adult. I didn't yeah. know any black people when I was a kid. There weren't any yeah. even in my village, you know, yeah. we didn't see them. And so the, it was an intriguing yeah. step change to, to suddenly realize there's a farmer yeah. in this country who lives in Devon. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the immigrant communities have built up communities in the cities and they haven't sort of branched out yet. And I mean, generally speaking, did you find the, the the pop, you know, your neighbours of your farm accepting. So when I when when I bought my place, um, 
the, the truth of the matter is that a lot of the people that I'd met had never met a black person before. Right. That uh, their idea of what, what what black people were like is obviously what they'd seen on television. Yeah. And um, you know, if there was any resistance, no one said anything to me. Right. And um, I suppose I was fortunate enough not to be seeking employment. And uh, therefore, that's the point. yes, you weren't trying. To, you weren't moving in and trying to get a job. So you weren't. Yeah. yeah so yeah. Um, it, um, it might it might have been a different experience if yeah. I was trying to get a job yeah. and, and trying to fit in. But obviously, yeah. I went and bought a farm and. You know, the whole idea was to launch my own brand and um, being in the, the sort of position that you're not dependent on anybody yeah. makes it a lot easier for yeah. you. I hope your driving's going to be good, you know, because we're going to go this, we're going around the countryside and all this other stuff. Very used to it. Very used to it. Yeah. Okay. The lanes where I live are terrifying. Oh, okay, <laughs> yeah, but, even I, who sort of used to driving yeah. around the countryside, had um, a few scratches yeah, in my yeah. car. Um, yeah, so I think that um, um, you know some people um, find it difficult um, to think that a black person would want to um, be based in, in a rural community. Yeah, but it worked basically. I mean, you, you know, it sounds what like it, you really enjoy doing it, and it, it's been a success. Isn't it? I mean, what it is, and I just think one of my philosophies in life is um, it takes a massive amount of energy to live life. And what you've got to do is put the energy in the in the right place. So I'm not going to waste any of my energy um, worried about other people's negativity. Yeah, yeah. Either people are supportive of, of what I'm doing, or they step aside. But I'm not yeah. going to allow them to um, prevent me going where I want to go. Yeah, yeah. But then, so they, because what was your background then before? You bought the farm. I don't know what else you did. But I did. You know, oh my God! My life is um, one great adventure. Right. I was uh, so I came to this country when I was four. Right. Wow. And then um, I was uh, brought up. Uh, first of all, we lived in Northampton, and then we were mainly brought up in Birmingham. Right. I'm from a family of eleven. Wow. So um, not only was uh, there eleven of us, but we lived in one of these sort of small two, two down terrace yeah. houses in a place called Small Heath. Um, and uh, we, you know, we were very, very poor. Life was very cramped. Um, and my father had an allotment, and it was my responsibility as the oldest boy to look after this allotment. So, as you can imagine, this allotment really became my oasis, yeah. away from the misery that I was surrounded by. Yeah. And what's quite interesting is that at the age of 11, I made myself a promise that one day I would like to buy my own farm. Right. Wow. And I didn't know I was going to do it, but everything yeah. I subsequently did um, was to get into a position um, to do it. Right. Um, so I went to the local secondary modern schools, as they were called then. Yeah. And um, I didn't do well at all at school. One of the problems that I have is that I'm dyslexic. So right. Yeah. Which different. wouldn't have been acknowledged yeah. at the time. Oh, yeah. 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 The, in those times, you know, I was just thought to be somebody that was thick. Yeah. And um, my headmaster didn't think I would do much with my life. Right. Uh, and so I left school without any qualifications and without much um, hope for my future. Yeah. So I joined the army. Oh, right. Yeah, but um, I joined the army with the wrong attitude. Right. So um, <laughs> I got kicked out of the army. Well. So then having got kicked out of the army, I then went into catering, which was a blessing because right. I really liked catering. Right. And I did that for a number of years. But one of the things that always sort of drove me was to try and get in a position to buy a farm. Right. So I um, decided I'd like to get a job in television. I, I spent about two years pleading with everybody to try and give me a break in television. Right. And a guy called Jock Gallagher eventually gave me a break. A really nice man. You know, I started off, and you're going to turn take, right take. here. Uh, not, not here, oh, no, 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 no. Um, and so I started off as a researcher and then went on to be uh, a producer making documentaries, wow. uh, travel the world making food and drink documentaries. Right. Like that. That's what that's so you weren't on camera, you were no, no, very, no. very sensible. You were behind oh, the oh, scenes, oh, yeah, you don't you want to be on camera. The worst job in the world is to be on camera. Exactly, I keep telling people that. You've got all these arseholes telling you what to do, you know, thinking it's bloody easy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Just do that again. Yeah, they're bloody <laughs> arseholes, and they're about 19 or something like that, aren't they? Yes. 
You say you want to turn around and slap them. Yeah. Because actually, one of the things being a producer director that I used to be always sympathetic with is that the, the most the toughest job in the world is the job in front of the camera. Uh, and it's that's very where, nice to hear that. I have to say. Oh yeah, because you're naked. You're yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You're exposed absolutely naked yeah. and, and exposed. Yeah. And um, if it doesn't work, you're the person that's going to get it in the neck. Yeah. So um, anyhow, I did that for a number of years. I actually, I did documentaries. I did a couple of dramas. Wow. And where was it, where were you based when you did that? Was that in, based it in London? Was, right? Based in London. Right. Yeah. Uh, I was pretty well known for a series called the Food and Drink Program, yeah. and a lot of the big name celebrity chefs, I was responsible for giving them their first wow. break in television, wow. like Gordon Ramsay, wow, right. and General Thompson, wow. Brian Turner. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they, they, they all went through me. Yeah, and we had some wonderful times together. I had a couple of fights with a few of them, <laughs> and which I probably shouldn't say on camera. <laughs> But, uh, the viewers would love to hear more, but I quite uh, understand yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> They're too famous now to sort of do them. Yes, you, can't, you can't say what you really think. <laughs> to say all that sort of stuff. Um, and, um, yeah, so I was at the BBC for about 10 years, actually. Right, right. And, uh, but again, because I wanted to buy the farm, I knew I had to sort of leave and earn some, earn some money. But I'm, what I'm impressed with is that that feeling you had when you were 11 yeah. stayed with you through it, because you'd think, you know, that life's experience would change that and you'd then go on oh yeah I used to want a farm when I was 11 but you know now no I'm but you see I, 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 I go around the country and I do lots of talks and there are a couple of things that are seriously important one is to have a dream yeah I mean the thing about the British is that we're quite cynical about things like dreams yes and, and you know it tends to be sort of poo poo but it's so so important yeah especially if you're from society's dustbin heap yeah. and um, you're on the bottom rung the only thing that you're going to have to keep um, focus it is that dream yeah and when my parents came to this country in the first place like a lot of immigrants um, well, that would have been a dream wouldn't it, that, that time, would have been yeah. a dream to better their lives and yeah. those of their offspring's life and say us the second third generation it's our responsibility to, to in a sense carry on yeah um, that, 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 that dream and the other thing that's quite important and my other big piece of, piece of advice is um, a lot of people have a dream to do something with their lives and the one thing that stops them doing it is fear. Yeah. The f fear of what could happen if it all goes wrong. Yeah. The difference between those who go and do it and those who don't is those who go and do it manage to somehow control their fear. Yeah. And that's all yeah. it is. And I can remember when I started my business, I had enough money to pay the mortgage for three months. Wow. But I just decided I had to do it. Yeah. And and what it does, it absolutely helps to focus you. And there you don't get distracted with the things around you that are, are irre irrelevant. Yes. Because uh, so look at this, this is a beautiful, beautiful view. Yeah, it's stunning. Gorgeous, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's so many things that could distract you. But again, the, the, the if you're prepared to work hard and you're focused and you're directed, um, what you will then discover is opportunity will come your way. Yeah. Because everything that I am today is based on people going out of their way to give me an opportunity. Yes. Yeah. And, and I'm very, very grateful for those people who have taken a chance with me. Yeah. But anyhow, so I, I ran a business for about 15 years and that again gave me the money to buy my farm. Right. So it took me 40 years to wow. get a position to buy a farm. That is a fantastic story. So you can imagine that by the time I got to my farm, I yeah. don't really give a shit about what anybody thinks about yes. it. It's taken a long time to really get here. Yeah. And um, you know, I've stuck the stake in the ground. Yeah. yeah. But also, I think the other thing that will be intriguing, I'm intrigued, okay. is that you are you're standing as a conservative. Yeah. Uh, Tory. A Tory. A Tory. Yeah. In Chippenham. Now, I mean, just quickly, because I don't know, what, who, is the, who is the sitting MP at the moment? What, no, so what's happened? There's been boundary changes. Right. And so this is a new constituency. The, the thing about this constituency is that uh, it's a bit of a dormitory for the, the likes of Bristol right. and Bath yeah. and Swindon. And one of the things that I'm pretty passionate about is that how we bring more um, businesses here. So that people work here and live here. Work here. Yeah. Because Chippenham is, is a gorgeous, gorgeous town. Yeah. But we lack investment. And, and, right. And um, it, all we need to do is, is to get some investments and businesses here. Yeah. And it will be one of those destination places. That's, that's what I would like to happen with Chippenham because right. we've got the most important thing you need is location. We've got yeah. a brilliant location. It is. Just off Junction 17 yeah. of the um, M4. Okay. The pollsters say that this is going to be a fight between myself and the Liberal Democrats. Yeah. Um, that based on 
um, 2005 um, election results. If everybody voted the same as they did in 2005, this would be a Lib Dem seat by about 2,000 votes. <sighs> Right. Oh, I see. So it's not it's not a it's so not a shoe in. You've got to you've got to fight for it. I've yeah. got to work for it basically. Yeah. And um, but uh, I should win the seat. I think that um, with there's obviously with a swing towards the the, the Conservatives. Yeah. Um, and I've spent um, a lot of time going around to, to meet the people in the community. Yeah. And um, I think people like the fact that I'm a new type of politician. Yeah. I'm not your typical um, career politician no. because the thing that irritates me straight over there straight over yeah. and, and also a lot of people is that um, you have these careerists that go into politics yeah and have no real understanding of um, um, ordinary the people's lives the, well you you've had enormous and broad experience exactly. of many things so yeah. when, you, when you're actually yeah. then thinking about policies to, to help people's lives it's based on some experience yeah. rather than something out of a textbook yes and I mean the feeling generally at the moment is you, you're getting a fairly positive feedback when you see people I mean you get it well yeah I mean look people generally are fed up and pissed off at politicians because yes, um, they've let them down really. yeah politicians and bankers are two oh, things yeah. that you and, <laughs> and rightly so because yeah. I mean I don't know if you've been to the House of Commons but for a I while have, yeah. there was this arrogance of um, thinking that somehow they were far more superior than the people that elected them, yes. that elections were somehow some sort of inconvenience they had to go yeah. through every five years. And it, and it became this sort of gentleman's club that um, was just not in touch with the, with, with, um, the rest of the country. Yeah. So people are right to be angry that there needs to be a massive clear out and I hope there Which, will I mean, I think that because there's so many MPs resigning anyway, aren't there? I mean, there's so many MPs not standing again Yeah, the, the I mean, coming election of all parties, isn't there? So. Yeah, I think that we're not going to have the sort of, the, 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 as much as a, 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 of a clear out as I would like, right. because just to get into the whole system, I mean, it's bloody expensive and it's really difficult being a candidate. Right. You know, you have to have some money. I mean, yeah. I could never, ever have afforded to have been a candidate if I was, you know, doing an ordinary nine-to-five job. Right. You're on your own, and it's really, really tough. Yeah. And what I would like to do is that I would like to see some changes in the system that people from my um, walk of life can actually go into politics, and I think politics will be better for it yeah. rather than just these groups who have become the sort of political elite. Yes, yeah. Somebody once said to me, you've got to be either mad, sad or bad to get into politics. Right. You've got to work out which one you are, really. So, no, I'm, 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 so I don't think I'm sad. <laughs> and I'm definitely not bad, so therefore I'm not mad. I'm yeah. not <laughs> mad, really. <laughs> it's outsiders who bring about change. Yeah. And, you know, this thing you're doing, for example, it's a brilliant, simple idea. Now. It's the thinking or the mind of an outsider that comes up with something right. as creative as this. Yeah. It's a struggle for you when you're um, yeah. in your sort of school days, and and it because the whole thing I think is that those on the inside have the rules of how you operate. Yes, and, and the understanding of the rules because I can exactly. understand the rules. Yeah. People could tell them to me; it didn't make any sense. Yeah, and and then, know, there I, is I, a code. It's yeah. a bit like falling in love. When you fall in love with somebody. It, you don't have to say anything. There is a there's an automatic understanding yeah. because yeah. You, un, you you pick up on the code of how you feel and yes. etc. Et etc. Et and so in elements of life, and when they talk about the old boy network, that's what it is. Is that they all understand the code. Yes. They understand that sort of the non-verbal language. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> for those of us who are on the outside, so whether you're a woman, whether you're an immigrant group, whether you're gay, yeah. whatever. You know, you're, you're at a massive disadvantage. But um, we're in the heart of uh, Britain. We're in what I call Britain's soul. Yeah. Everything that's uh, made Britain great, its history, you find in this constituency. Right. The first thing that you know, I have to um, be very grateful for is that they had the courage to select someone like me. Yeah. And I won on the first ballot. And so wow. that, that's, that's Middle England. And presumably uh, there were other candidates who were, oh, I mean, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. sure there were some who were your classic. Oh, yeah, yeah. So the, 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 the posh chap. The, the betting would have been that it would have been your classic um, Tory type that yeah. would have won the, won the seat. Yeah. But, you know, these true blues, as I say, Middle Englanders, 
selected me wow. as their candidate, which 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 sends a massive message to, yeah. them, to the rest of the yeah, So without anybody interfering and without anybody telling them what to right. do, they decided that this guy from my unorthodox background yeah. would be the right person to represent our interests. Yeah. And so that's why if I do win, and I think that I should win, it, it, it's a great testament to the um, to Middle England. Yeah, yeah. Okay, this is where you probably need to. This is quite narrow, and that's quite a bit. All right, yeah, you told me. <laughs> it's a bit. Dodgy, and he doesn't right? even want to slow down that no, much. No. Whoa, I, I, it was fine. There's loads of room. Okay. <laughs> Just looked scary. Yeah. <laughs> if, we, if we don't win this constituency, Cameron doesn't win the the election. Right. It's it's right. That, as it's, simple as that. It's, right. It's that knife edge. We yeah. are the twenty second. Um, target seat. Uh, right. Uh, I mean, if I was against Labour, the, 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 the chances would go up, but because it's sort of um, a little right, bit I see. Left, left here. Left here. I'll just take up another hill. All right, that's good. Uh, and that's why it's quite important to, to base myself on the constituency, so I'm here um, all the time. Yeah. I'm frustrated that we, as the small people, just don't seem to be, seem to matter that there is all these small elite groups yeah. who are determining our fate and uh, you know some hundred years ago people would be on the streets about that yeah. sort of stuff yeah. and these men in grey suits in little smoke rooms making decisions that affect our lives shouldn't have the sort of power that right. they have at the moment because I mean it is well I'm intrigued by it and I and I because I, I, I'm really intrigued to hear all that but the tradition I grew up in in the 1970s I mean I, I guess we're roughly uh, roughly of an age well, how old are you then? I'm, I'm 53 all oh, right you're a year older than me I'm a year older than you yeah um, uh, it was that you know the the parties of the left were the ones that were opposed to big corporations and you know big government you know yeah. that stuff and, yeah. and they and the parties of the right were effectively from the same class and the same background as the bankers and the corporate bosses and da, da, da. Yeah. where is that What's happened in the last ten years is that's completely flipped around. I, I watched Gordon Brown giving speeches at the Mansion House two or three years ago, mm -hmm. congratulating bankers on their innovative approaches to yeah. financial. And that's and that's tools. for me that has been the fundamental problem. Extraordinary and, and what turnaround. Happens, it, 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 it's about laziness. Yeah. If you've got you know the head of Tesco's or the head of so and so bank where you sit down and you do, sort of do deals, that's a lot easier. But what you want to do is that you want to be able to give all these small individuals the opportunity to do things. And yeah. that's what we need to come back to. Yeah. And one of the points I was trying to make earlier is that I think the zeitgeist is going to go towards that sort of direction. That Because there's this lack of trust with corporate Britain and these big institutions, yeah. what you're going to do is then really have dealings with people that you know that you can trust. So it's a great time to launch a business if you as the individual is going to be fronting that business yeah. and having the relationship with the, with, with the sort of public. Yeah. And um, I would like to see the, the small individual being empowered a lot more right. than they have been over the last sort of 15 years. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm, what I'm doing now is I'm sitting in a car with a future Tory MP and I'm agreeing with everything you're saying. And you're not a natural Tory? <laughs> no, definitely not. Well, no, I mean, then a Lib Demi, well, you're no, arty, I don't, I mean, so I'm an arty, farty, wet liberal. No, you are, you're a classic, aren't you? The thing about being liberal, and this is going to be the challenge for the Liberal Democrats at, the, at this coming election, it's a bit like being a commentator on life, is that you don't necessarily have to make a fundamental decision because yeah. it's not it's not affecting you. Yeah. So you could sit there in your ivory tiles and theorize because you know you're never going to be in power yeah. and and to be a critic. Yes. Uh, whereas if you've got to physically do something, um, your your politics suddenly changes because yeah. you're not on the sidelines. Yeah. So, no, you've got so, me to, to, to I've got, I'm, I'm bank to rights, Governor. <laughs> exactly. So when you talk to your liberal friends, your wet liberals, it says, if there's one time in your life you got to get off your bloody yeah. high horse, your dinner party, talking about the theories yeah. and make a decision about something which is so, so fundamental yeah. about our society. Yeah. This is the moment. Yes. You know? <laughs> so chuck away your bloody sandals and go. <laughs> It's not fair. It's, it's not sandals. fair, but true. <laughs> My yeah. politics are pretty simple. You either believe in traffic lights or roundabouts. Right. Traffic lights is about control. Yes. Okay. Roundabout <laughs> is leaving it to you as individuals yeah. to get on with to it. Not, to not pull out when it's stupid to. Yeah. yeah. And trusting that people 
will do that. You know, sometimes yeah. you'll have accidents, yeah. but actually, generally, it actually yeah. works. Traffic lights is about control. You go yeah. when we say we can. Right. There are a number of things that I'm quite passionate about, and farming is one of them. And I think I was horrified when I bought my farm to see this massive gulf between urban and rural yeah. Britain. Yeah. And that. What's fascinating is that we've got a brand in this country called the Fair Trade brand. Yeah. And the whole premise behind that brand is that that money then goes to help farmers in a third world country, which is obviously a pretty noble thing to do. But the British consumer does not have the same sentiment about their own the, British their farmers. Own, yeah. okay? So there is this massive disconnect between urban and rural uh, Britain. Yeah. If you look at our um, European cousins, you'll see that there is a much stronger connection. They're far more supportive yeah. of their sort of food producers, yeah. and we've got to get back to that situation. And um, I just think, for example, what has happened over the last 20, 30 years is that the supermarkets have become the gatekeepers to the consumer. Yeah. So the consumers they don't know who produce their foods. Yeah. There is no relationship with them. And in a sense, when I launched my brand, the Black Farmer brand, that was the whole purpose of that, was to make right. sure that my consumers could have a relationship directly with me. And it's about the British consumer understanding the massive power that they have. The yeah. only people that the supermarkets fear are the consumers. Yes, and so <laughs> it's a very it, good point, isn't it? Yeah, they're, they're, they're certainly not scared that. of farmers. Yeah, they're not here, but they're, they're <laughs> frightened of the consumers. Yeah. So the consumers say, that this is unfair, that this is unjust. Yeah. The supermarkets would change um, uh, accordingly. Yeah. Oh, should we go out that way? Yeah. This is stunning. This is it. Yeah. Yeah. It's gorgeous, well, isn't it? Yeah. This, ladies and gentlemen, if only you could see this, come to Laycock. Yeah, Laycock is it's a national trust. <laughs> it uh, is a beautiful, it is that is, beautiful. Because if you took the cars away, yeah. that's why film people love yeah. it. Yeah, all the big things, it's all the big costume dramas. Uh, wow. So, you know, there's no. Satellite this is no there's no there's telephone, no telephone wire, there's wire. no telephone mic lines, there's no yeah, yeah, yeah. TV aerials. Wow. Yeah. What a yeah. um, I, you've done, it's been a I've had a very uh, educational trip this morning. Yeah. Fantastic. You could just park here actually. It's probably is that is that okay? Yeah. All right. Uh, I, there's me trying to break. Oh, right, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Not uh, that you'd like to be in control. No, 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 no. <laughs> I just felt my foot going, break, break. You've, took, you've, you've, you've bashed my Have I? very loosely held convictions <laughs> into a cocked hat. I'm right. really impressed. It's right. been really it's been a very genuine fun. pleasure to meet you. I'm really impressed. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time. Okay. There's a weird thing about this skeptics community. It's this. There's a whole subculture of skeptics right. uh, that a lot of people don't even know exists. Yeah. Um, but they're populated quite a bit by magicians and um, for instance I got involved in it because I was a magician I worked my way through college as a magician wow. running a magic shop Wow and <laughs> see so, it's always worth getting people in the car <laughs> so yeah she's a magician <laughs> just get into it I was <laughs> but so, can you do like actual I mean I won't, we won't talk about magicians for a long time but can you do those clever tricks with cards and coins yeah and I did I, I, wow. I really liked cards mostly as a right. close-up magician right.